So hello everyone, uh, welcome to this uh, latest iteration of our local government governance seminar series. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Andy Sankton as our presenter for today. Um, Andy and the local government program have long been synonymous. Uh, I think you know the current crop of students, of which a few are here today, are probably the first ones in like over 25 years to not have a relationship with Andy in any meaningful way, either as an instructor or uh, or as a supervisor for their their major research paper. So Andy has published widely throughout his career on issues like amalgamation, local boundaries, uh, and provincial municipal relations. More recently, he's been energized by topics uh, like open municipal meetings and representation by population through some of his consultancy work. So today he's talking to us about towns without municipal governments, so please join me in welcoming Andy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we've got a, an intimate uh, group here, but you can be assured that we've got thousands of people watching uh, on the uh, internet. So welcome to all you people who are, uh, who are out there on the internet. Um, I'm actually talking uh, in large measure about the uh, internet and the World Wide Web today, so it's appropriate that uh, uh, we, uh, we have this uh, online connection. Um, my subject is a bit unusual. I guess when you're retired, you can pick unusual topics. Uh, don't have to impress anybody, sort of do what interests you. Uh, it, it is a little bit topical, uh, though. I was surprised to see from my uh, Globe and Mail uh, online feed yesterday and the print copy today, there's a big story in the Globe about exactly the opposite of what I'm talking about today. Uh, it's a, a story in the Globe about a uh, town in Nova Scotia uh, that is disappearing as a town, but it has a municipal government. And uh, the problem is what to do with the municipal government when nobody's there. Because uh, no, none of the neighboring places want to be with this uh, municipal government because it's in debt and it's uh, not a prosperous place at all. Um, the place is called Mulgrave, Nova Scotia, on the uh, Cancel Strait there. And um, anyway, what I'm talking about is the exact opposite of that. It's places that uh, exist as physical towns, uh, but don't have uh, their own uh, municipal governments. Excuse me, and I'll define uh, what I mean by that in a minute. Uh, again, before getting going, I just want to acknowledge that I did receive, for the first time in my career, uh, some research assistance from my son, Derek, who actually learned about uh, online marketing from some courses that he took. And uh, uh, he at least knew how to search for some of these places. He ended up looking at many more cases than I uh, looked at and that I decided in the end to narrow it down so that I could uh, be a little more familiar myself with what was actually going on. So um, the uh, background, I do have some slides that are just writing like this, but most of my slides are actually uh, uh, screen shots of various uh, websites, uh, so there is a lot of visual stuff that's coming in this uh, presentation. Since the late 1960s, uh, many places that we know as towns and villages uh, in Ontario have lost their municipal governments due to restructuring and amalgamation. Um, obviously, my interest in this topic has sort of stems from my interest in uh, amalgamations, but it's not the same uh, topic is that at all. Um, so these towns and villages continue to exist. They have signs saying welcome, often, often, not always, they have signs saying welcome to this place. We all talk about these places as existing, um, but as a particular place, it doesn't have its own municipal government and a mayor. But I would think that businesses and property owners in these places still have major incentives uh, to promote or to brand uh, their particular place uh, rather than their territorially larger municipality. And uh, my question that I'm asking is how do they do so on the uh, World Wide Web? And uh, in order to uh, carry out this study, I've got to have some uh, way of uh, figuring out what exactly these places are and how many people uh, live in them. And um, for that, of course, I need to know, use the uh, census. 
And I think people who work in municipalities are, are used to uh, using uh, census counts for municipalities, uh, which you, you will know are, uh, are called census subdivisions uh, in the uh, census, the, the divisions being uh, counties and regional governments, subdivisions being municipalities. But the census is always also counted places that it, until 2011, called urban areas. And these urban areas were the source of the quite well-known uh, statement that Canada is among one of the most urbanized uh, countries in the world. Uh, the definition of an urban area was that it only had to have a thousand people in it, um, and I'll give a more precise definition in a minute, uh, but it did mean, that particular definition, that Moussigny uh, got counted as an urban area and that they were part of the great urban population of uh, Canada. Uh, so urban area actually was recognized as a misleading term and uh, in 2011 Statistics Canada changed uh, the uh, name to population uh, centers and that's why I have population centers in my, the title of my uh, presentation. This is a little technical, we don't have to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, <coughs> the key point is that, uh, that there has to be a thousand people in a relatively uh, uh, dense area. I mean, it has to be <laughs> look like a town or a village. Uh, it has to be a thousand people there. There's a whole bunch of other subsidiary rules about uh, figuring out contiguity. Um, the one that's perhaps most relevant to us is if the distance between two population centers is less than two kilometers, then the population centers are combined to form a single one. And this does lead to some difficult situations. Um, I really took a long time to figure this out. Uh, this was beyond Derek's capability because he didn't, uh, didn't know about the municipal stuff. Um, the issue comes uh, up in relation to Trenton, which uh, people have probably heard of. Um, and if you drive along the 401, you actually uh, drive across, the, I guess it's the Trent River there, and it's your, right near Trenton. And Trenton, which used to be a city, is now part of the uh, a city of Quinte West. Um, this shows uh, from Statistics Canada the map of the Belleville Population Center. So over here is Belleville, it's the 401, uh, and this is where you cross the river and where you're just touching Trenton. This is Trenton, and uh, uh, this is the old Highway 2, and I guess it's a single population center because uh, it's all contiguous, it meets the definition, so it's According to the Statistics Canada, there's no such place as Trenton. There's no such population center. It's all Belleville. Um, this is particularly confusing because um, uh, Trenton is um, in a completely separate municipality, which, as I said, is Quinte uh, West. So this is one of the difficulties of my, constructing my universe of places. Um, Trenton doesn't count as one of these uh, places. And you can't even get the population figure for Trenton uh, unless you went into more, much more detailed census tract data and stuff that you could get uh, off the web from Statistics Canada. Nevertheless, even Trenton uh, does have a, uh, a website. It shows up if you look, if you, look, if you search for Trenton, um, you find uh, this interesting uh, designation, Trenton, Ontario a city of Quinte West. This must be crystal clear to anybody who's really trying to find out what the hell Trenton is. Um, anyway, this is a privately operated uh, website um, and uh, it looks like, uh, sorry, all the people who get their links on here pay the private operators to have that and th th this is, this is uh, not unusual for, um, uh, well there are a few other cases of the ones that I'm, I'll be looking at. Um, I just want to, uh, before, this is a bit of a sideline, to show three different versions of London, because everybody here at least has some idea of what London is, and I just want to, everybody to be clear about what we're talking about. Uh, this is the map of the London Population Centre from Statistics Canada. It goes outside the boundaries through the Kilworth up here. It goes along uh, outside the boundaries, I think along D D Dundas to the um, uh, east. But it doesn't include any of the area of London which is in south of 401, which is rural and um, is therefore not part of a population center. 
the population of that, you can see on the slide, 383,437. The population of the city of London is almost exactly the same, but the boundaries are different. The unfortunate thing about this, these maps are that the scale changes from one map to another. Uh, this is a much a considerably larger territory because it goes down to Elgin County, which is inside, uh, you know, this is all the city of London uh, uh, municipal boundaries. And then the third version of London, which uh, many of you are familiar with, uh, if you follow unemployment figures and all kinds of economic data, is the census metropolitan area, which is the commuter shed uh, for London. And Statistics Canada, of course, has definitions about how they define the commuter shed. But you can see it goes all the way down to Lake Erie, includes St. Thomas, and uh, halfway up to uh, Lake Huron. Um, so we're not talking in this presentation I'm not talking about census metropolitan areas uh, uh, at all, but you gotta realize that for big cities, these units exist as well. So you have to keep in mind that many population centers include all or parts of a number of different municipalities. So uh, Toronto, for example, includes Mississauga and a whole bunch of other places because it's a continuously built up urban uh, area. Some municipalities contain more than one population center. Uh, Chatham Kent famously contains five, um, which makes it a very difficult place to govern, as all you have to do is talk to anybody in our MPA classes who comes from Chatham Kent. Do we have anybody uh, here from the, there? I don't think so. Anyway, I just, every time I have had a class, somebody from Chatham Kent uh, in, the, in my classes, I hear about these kinds of difficulties. Um, I'll come back to Chatham Kent a little later on. And not all municipalities contain a population center at all. Uh, for example, the, ta the township of Adelaide Metcalf, uh, which is within the London Census Metropolitan Area and has a population of uh, 20, uh, 2,990, um, is, is no, no population center. So that's where uh, that is. This, of course, is London down, uh, down here. Okay. Uh, that's, in a sense, all introductory kind of stuff. Um, this presentation is about population centers which have a population of 5,000 that are in municipalities. That's why it's a bit misleading for me to say they don't have municipal government at all. That was kind of a teaser. Um, uh, but the name of the population center uh, is not included in the name of the municipality. And I think this is a serious issue. Um, for example, in Saskatchewan, if you had a population of 5,000 people, under the Saskatchewan Municipal Act, you'd be eligible to be a city. Um, Manitoba has recently gone through a controversial amalgamation process uh, where uh, places that were, had a population of less than 1,000 were forced to merge with somebody so that their population could become over 1,000. If they had a place that was 5,000 people, this would be like a massive uh, urban center outside uh, Winnipeg. So in relation to other places, I would say in North America, uh, 5,000 is not a particularly small a number. And I suspect in Newfoundland, uh, 5,000 people would be uh, uh, considered quite a significant place. Um, so that's what I say. In most jurisdictions, 5,000 is therefore a relatively high municipal population number. So I found, using those criteria, that there were 35 population centers in Ontario uh, with populations over 5,000 that didn't have uh, their own municipal government with that name in it. Um, incidentally, if it was a double or even triple barreled name, and it included the name of the population center, it did not get included in my cases. It had to be um, no reference at all to the name of the place. And of these, the most populous was Kanata, uh, outside Ottawa. I'll have more to say about that in a minute. The one that just squeaked over the line was Al Monte, which is also in the Ottawa uh, area. Now, there were three ways in which um, municipal governments were lost three different mechanisms and time periods. Well, some of the time periods overlap. Um, and I haven't gone back and checked, but I checked a few of them and I'm 98% sure that all of these population centers at one time or another had some form of municipal government. It might have just been a police village uh, uh, 
because I did find one or two that were police villages, but there certainly there were many that were villages and towns. Um, so one uh, mechanism was lower tier restructuring for regional governments. This happened in the late 1960s and early 1970s. It happened within places like uh, uh, the region of Peel, region of Halton, uh, Waterloo, Niagara. Uh, so that's 60s and 70s. Then it was, you had restructuring within counties. Uh, that's the kind of restructuring that created uh, municipalities like Adelaide, Metcalf, where different places merged uh, together within, but the county structure remained the same. Um, and some of those took place, many of those took place during the Harris years. But then you had the, amal the outright single tier amalgamations uh, during the Harris years. And one case I threw out because it was a very special case, uh, uh, the, uh, it's where uh, Camp Borden is, the Canadian Forces base in Essa Township, and uh, uh, it qualified as a population center because it was a military uh, uh, base, but not for any other reason, I guess. So one of the things that I was surprised at um, was that the regional government cases uh, were the most uh, uh, prominent among these. And in other words, most of the places lost their, their own municipal governments during um, uh, the uh, uh, creation of regional governments. And uh, so that was a long time ago. And I puzzled about this because I thought, gee, it's, well, why didn't we have more of this happening uh, in the uh, amalgamations and the restructurings that c came later? Then I realized that the regional governments are all in, uh, well, now they're all in uh, the Greater Golden Horseshoe in the area around Toronto, which is the fastest growing uh, area of Ontario, obviously. And in some senses, the regional governments were designed to accommodate more population and accommodate them not always, but often in existing population centers. So many of the places that fall into my list here uh, were places that were sort of designated by regional governments as places to grow. And so that's, not, that's why they got to be more than 5,000 people in the, in the first place. Many of the places that lost their uh, municipal governments, by my definition, uh, that are under five, uh, that happened during the amalgamations and restructuring are still under 5,000 and therefore didn't make, didn't make my, uh, my list. Um, so there are 14 of these regional government cases altogether. Uh, the name of the population center is in red there. The next number along is the 2016 population. Uh, the next uh, place is the name of the lower tier municipality in which the uh, population center is exist, ex exists. Then it's the name of the regional government. And the last one, which I'll come back to, is what kind of a w website they have. BIA stands for Business Improvement Area. So uh, this is just the list of the cases that you can take a look at. Um, going down in order of uh, population. So I mean, many people will know of most of these places, right? To say you're going to go to Port Perry. Um, most people don't say they're going to go to Scugog Township or something. They're going to, they're, they're going to go to Port Perry, which is a uh, uh, picturesque little place on the shores of Lake Scugog in Durham region. Um, so that completes the list of the regional government uh, uh, cases. Does anybody have any questions about what, that, that, what those two slides were about? OK. Um, then the next list is um, the eight restructured county cases. And uh, basically the same arrangement here, except they're in green. Um, it's the name of the lower tier municipality comes after the population, then the name of the county, and then uh, the kind of website uh, that they have. So there's only eight of those uh, populations over 5,000, which is less than the regional government cases. And then there were 12 population centers uh, uh, that are included in single tier amalgamations, including the largest one, uh, the most populous one, which is Canada, uh, including Lindsay, uh, which is in the famously named uh, city of Kawartha Lakes, known by the locals, many of the locals, I shouldn't say all of them, it's the city of Kawartha Mistakes, um, but uh, uh, Valley East and Sudbury, uh, 
you can go down the uh, go down the list. I'll be coming back to some of these. Um, any questions on those last ones? Okay. Um, so, my general observations about the presence of these places on the World Wide Web. Um, almost all of them have Wikipedia entries of one kind or another. I be interested to know who does all these Wikipedia entries for these population centers, whether it's a local person or whether it's somebody who's dedicated their lives to doing Wikipedia entries for Ontario population centers. Uh, all of them have wiki boxes, which I didn't even know existed until re recently. I have an example on the next slide. I don't know who makes the wiki boxes for population centers. If anybody knows, I'd be interested to find out. They don't have identical formats, so it doesn't look like uh, they are made automatically. Um, now, I hope you'll forgive this indulgence that I'm coming up in the next slide. Um, I will admit, terrible admission, I have been known to Google myself uh, to see what my World Wide Web presence is. I'm sure none of you would ever do that. Um, if your name was Joe Smith, you'd have a problem, perhaps. Uh, but uh, I'm the only Andrew Sancton in the world, except for one other person who's a distant relative of mine. He wasn't, he's not in my line of business and doesn't write stuff. So, you know, I, it's, you can find my stuff relatively easily. This only happened a couple of weeks ago, and I was pretty shocked to find out. I looked, uh, well, first of all, I, I'll, go, I'll do this part, and then I'll come back to Bowman. So this wiki box shows up on my, um, when I Google myself. I don't know where the hell that came from. I didn't do it. Um, then I figured somebody in the department must have done it. But we all know how universities work. I mean, they're not going to do it for some people and not for other people. Um, some people in the department have wiki boxes. They didn't do everything, but other people don't. So I figured this must have been done from a by Amazon or something. It's only rel it only relates to um, uh, books that I've uh, published. Um, so where do these things... But this is the reason I, this is relevant to what I'm talking about is because each of these population centers have these wiki boxes which shows up right on uh, when you search for them. So this is how it looks for uh, Google search for Bowmanville. Um, you, get a Wiki, you get a Wikipedia entry. You get a box over here that shows you where it is. Uh, in, <coughs> in this case, you have the Bowmanville BIA. I'll come back to that. Um, but this is an example of the, municipal, of, of the population center boxes uh, that I'm talking about. Almost all municipalities seem to have Wiki, Wiki boxes as well. Um, I did do a Google search to find out uh, who makes wiki boxes, and I just I got instructions about how to get how to make one. But um, again, I, I don't know who does it uh, as a matter of course for a whole bunch of places and things. So uh, towns that have municipal governments, like I just picked randomly St. Mary's, um, generally speaking, the municipal website comes up first um, and the box shows the boundaries and notable things like the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, so this is what it looks like for a, a place with, a, with a, uh, a municipal government. Of the 34 cases that I'm looking at, uh, 16 of them have no website at all. Uh, and the most populous of those is Canada, which is also the most populous overall. Um, I think the only reason Canada qualifies as a population center, um, as opposed to being part of the Ottawa one, is because uh, of the green belt in Ottawa. So it's not contiguous, not connect connected uh, to uh, Ottawa. But it's clearly a suburb of Ottawa. Everybody recognizes that. We can have our debates about whether uh, suburban municipalities should be merged into the central uh, city. Um, but, I mean, it is pretty strange that Canada counts as a population center and Mississauga doesn't. Uh, with Mississauga with, with 600,000 people or something. Uh, but the reason that, that is you can be driving along uh, between Toronto and Mississauga and you hardly, except for the river, you hardly notice that there's any break in the uh, uh, urban fabric, but you clearly recognize it. Uh, if you're driving between Ottawa and Canada because of the Green Belt. Uh, so I've covered that, I think. Um, so this is an example of a web presence of a, uh, of a place 
that doesn't have a formal, uh, it's formally own, own website. Um, it's got a Wikipedia entry. It's got something called a simple English Wikipedia entry, which I'm not exactly sure what that is. Um, it's got TripAdvisor, it's got Hotels.com, and it's got um, a boss that somebody, uh, that got, I guess say somebody, some bot or some entity created this thing. And it says uh, that it's in the municipality of Ottawa and that the mayor is Jim Watson. It doesn't tell you who the councillors are uh, for uh, Canada, which if you're sort of interested in Canada's political representation, you might want to know who the councillors are rather than who the mayor of Ottawa is. But if it's a machine that's doing this, how would they know? Um, so Wallaceburg is an interesting one uh, for me. Uh, I don't know if you all know where Wallaceburg uh, is. Uh, it's in Chatham, Kent, so it's north uh, uh, west of here, or west uh, on the shores of Lake St. Clair, right? Um, and uh, uh, as far as I can tell, but it certainly cannot be considered a suburb. It's not a suburb of any place. It's a, it's a small Ontario town that happens to have a population of 10,000 people. I would love to find out if it is the largest freestanding town in North America that doesn't have its own uh, municipal government or doesn't have the option of having its own municipal government. I expect it is. And <laughs> what's particularly notable about uh, 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 Wallaceburg is that it's not that Wallaceburg is the biggest uh, population, the most populous population center surrounded by a whole bunch of little villages and farmland and everything, and Wallaceburg is the, is the hub of it. What's interesting about Wallaceburg is it's got 10,000 people in it, and there's a larger population center, uh, what we used to know as the city of Chatham, um, that uh, dominates uh, the politics of, uh, of the municipality of, uh, of Chatham-Kent. Um, so, if anybody's looking for a research uh, project, I think it would be fun to do something about the politics of Wallaceburg and uh, uh, try to find out whether uh, it, it is indeed uh, uh, the largest population center that falls into this category. Um, it has no significant web presence and uh, significantly the, the wiki box shows the corporate boundaries of Wallaceburg as they were prior to 1996. So this is going on uh, 20 years now, more than 20 years. Um, and uh, this is also, uh, these are also the boundaries of the Wa Wallaceburg ward uh, within uh, Chatham-Kent. Um, and, that, and the ward boundaries and the representation hasn't changed within Chatham-Kent since it was amalgamated, which I think is a complete scandal. should be unconstitutional, but there's no constitutional provision that uh, applies here. Uh, it's just bad uh, that uh, uh, particularly these pl kinds of places that I'm talking about, but also other places in Ontario, simply don't have uh, equal votes. Uh, uh, because the ward system is all out of uh, whack, doesn't have equal populations. Anyway, Wallaceburg is big like this, but not only are they large, but they don't have any uh, web presence other than uh, the Wikipedia, the TripAdvisor, and an artic article from 2010 from Canadian uh, Geographic. Obviously, you can go, uh, these are screenshots, you could go down further and find things, but you don't find a local uh, uh, websites. Now, eight of the, my cases have websites that are run by business improvement areas. Um, they tend to be the most elaborate and quite impressive, I think, in many cases. But often you have to look pretty hard to find out who made this uh, website. You have to dig, you know, dig in and go to the about part and you might find a little reference uh, looked after by the business improvement area. And unlike municipalities, the business improvement area doesn't tell you anything about how it's internally governed itself. There's no minutes, there's no uh, budgets or anything like that. It's, it's all fluff about what a great place uh, uh, this particular area uh, is. So the most populous population center <coughs> with a BIA website is Georgetown uh, within uh, Halton Hills, within the region of Halton. And uh, this is just one picture. The pictures roll over. You get to see what a terrific place uh, uh, Georgetown uh, is. Um, 
I think I got the information uh, about uh, that it comes from a BIA from the About Us uh, uh, entry there. Three websites, three of the cases have websites that are run by private operators. Valley East is the most populous. Uh, the two others are Tottenham and Almonte, and all three uh, appear to be commercial enterprises seeking paid advertising, and that would be like the Trenton one that I showed you before. Uh, this is uh, Valley East. Um, so uh, you get an idea about how they're promoting themselves there. This is an example of a, what I'm calling a direct municipal link. Uh, and uh, I actually think it's sort of best practice for amalgamated uh, municipalities. If you look up Listowel, uh, you find uh, that it will send you directly to this page where it gives you information about Listowel. Um, it tells you that you're in the municipality of Perth North. Uh, but <coughs> this goes down a bit about you know the history and that, that kind of thing. That's I mean, given that you've got an amalgamated municipality, that seems a pretty good way of dealing with the uh, the issue, as far as I can see it. So it also applies. Uh, that also happens within uh, Dunville, which is in Norfolk or Haldimand. I forget which one. One of those. Um, in the case of New Hamburg, which is in uh, uh, Waterloo region. Uh, there is a local website that comes up right at the top. It's the local uh, uh, newspaper. Uh, maybe it's just an online paper, but anyway, the New Hamburg Independent comes up. So I'm considering that as kind of a separate category of, of a newspaper. It's a local, local newspaper, so it has local uh, content for it. Uh, Caledonia, uh, which is in Haldeman County, I believe, uh, famous for the uh, um, being adjacent to uh, the uh, Brantford Six Nations and uh, famous for the occupation a few years ago. Uh, there's no reference to that in the uh, uh, Caledonia Chamber of Commerce uh, website. Uh, it's grand to be in Caledonia. It tells you all the great things about it. Um, that's the Grand River, I guess. Um, but, I mean, it's logical that you'd have a Chamber of Commerce or, or a Board of Trade uh, providing this kind of a website. It's locally controlled. And Port Dover has the same uh, arrangement. Crystal Beach in the city of Fort Erie in Niagara region is uh, different again. It's the only case where there is a Municipal Economic Development Corporation uh, and it has a direct link uh, to uh, the Crystal Beach. So it's like the listable one, except instead of being the municipality, it's the kind of hived off uh, economic development uh, corporation that provides that uh, link. Um, in Port Elgin, uh, they say they have an official uh, tourist website, and it's provided by what looks like some kind of chain operation. Uh, called Tourist Town. So I guess if you are a tourist town, you can get your website uh, prepared by these people and you sign up. Uh, uh, if you're a provider of accommodation or a restaurant or something, you get that on there. And um, uh, it's like a private operation, except I, it looks to me like a chain that, uh, that does these for tourist towns. So, I mean, you might think this is all, you might be right. It's all just self-indulgent stuff that, uh, you know, I'm, nobody would care about, and you've been stuck with this. But um, I think there are interesting issues here about units of analysis in our study of urban and local politics. First of all, we absolutely have to know what happens within municipalities. I'm not questioning that for a minute. I spend most of my time, I'm sure most of you people spend your time, uh, looking at what happens within municipalities, the politics of it, the structures, all those kinds of things. But I've always thought uh, as I you know, tried to come at this field, that we were interested in looking at territorial communities in one form or another. Um, we weren't just interested in the formal municipal uh, corporations. And most of the stuff that I've written over my uh, career uh, has related to metropolitan areas, however you define them. Uh, in most cases, you can get away with defining them as census metropolitan areas, except in Toronto it's too complex for that. <coughs> but I consider myself mainly being a, a student of metropolitan areas. 
But population centers have been ignored. We don't know about uh, what goes on within these uh, uh, real places that don't have their own municipal governments. And uh, I think these places are, uh, have great relevance after restructuring and amalgamation in Ontario. Um, and maybe places like Georgetown and Acton um, and uh, what they at? Bowmanville and Newcastle, these are all the places in the Greater Golden Horseshoe. Maybe it did make sense for them to be part of some wider unit uh, uh, originally. But when you're up at 40,000 people, um, it's surprising to me that there hasn't been some pressure from within these places to have more control over uh, uh, their own uh, uh, politics uh, of the real place. And I assume that happens because people in Ontario just think it's, we live in a place, but it's none of our business how our municipal government is structured. It's for the province to decide how. And that's a very, very unusual uh, uh, state of mind um, for uh, people to, to have, I think. Um, anyway, business improvement areas have filled a vacuum, uh, but obviously they are designed to be business dominated. That's the definition of a business improvement area. It, it only includes businesses. Um, and uh, uh, local businesses are likely to want better community web presences, especially where there is no BIA. I would think that if there wasn't, if there wasn't a BIA or the BIA wasn't doing anything in these places, that would be the first step. You'd think you'd better get moving on this stuff. Um, to leave the, your web presence if you're a population center, and of course there's no, the problem with the population center is there's nobody to call there. There's no entity, right? Uh, Henry Kissinger said about Europe a long time ago before they had the European Foreign Ministry and everything, who do I call when I want to contact Europe? Um, well, it's the same thing here. Who do you contact if you want to contact a population center? There is no mayor, councillor, or anything. You might be able to find a, a ca local councillor, or there is a BIA. Um, these other entities that I talked about. But you don't want to have your web presence, but, and the web is obviously so important, I think even for old people like me, um, you don't want to have it in the hands of TripAdvisor, uh, Hotel.com, uh, Wikipedia, where you have no local control at all. Um, so I think the sort of political policy dilemma for amalgamated municipalities, restructured ones, whatever form it, it took, um, is, a, two different ways of proceeding. One is, to, do you put all the emphasis on fostering a unified municipal identity where you kind of pretend that these population centers don't exist, that they're, that they're all, we're all part of a happy uh, family? You might put a little sign up saying, welcome to Lindsay, a community in the city of Kawartha Lakes, but you don't want to, you don't go in much further than that. Um, and if I were a, a municipal CAO or a mayor, uh, I would probably want to adopt this approach. You want to build an identi identity with uh, the municipality rather than uh, with the local areas. Uh, but the other alternative, which I actually favor, perhaps to some of you not surprisingly, uh, would be to pr promote the unique identities of individual population centers uh, within the municipality. And I suspect that would likely be favored uh, by local business interests within the smaller population centers. Um, so I think it's an interesting question that people should be considering, especially in those uh, places. Um, I don't think it's a common uh, problem in North America. It's an Ontario problem, I would say, primarily. Um, but I think one of the problems is that people don't realize in Ontario that it's a uniquely, uh, almost a uniquely Ontario problem. They just think this is the natural order of things. It's not the natural order of things for a place like Wallaceburg uh, to uh, not have a mayor and a council. Um, so with that polemical closing, I'll uh, stop. Okay. Uh, questions, comments for anything? Yes. Come across any um, read, well, like urban center specific Facebook groups in, uh, in the searches through there. Um, at least St. Mary's being a, a, a weird place where I live. Uh, there's a couple of very prominent Facebook groups that uh, uh, you know screw council. They're much happier to discuss all their issues no. in St. Mary's life. Uh, for example, but uh, I don't know how much, how deep your search has gone into those. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, all I can say is 
none of them showed up near the top in the, on the first page of uh, Google. And uh, um, I either read it or my son told me that if it's not on the first page of Google, it doesn't count. I mean, unless you're a crazy academic looking for some obscure uh, things, you just, you just pay attention to what's uh, on the front. So I did, the answer is, good question, I don't know, but they didn't show up on the, at the top. Okay. It seems to me that the only other place where you find this would be uh, yeah, uh, certainly within uh, uh, some parts of Nova Scotia anyway, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Halifax being the main one, and, and Cape Breton. Cape yeah. Breton, but I mean, even Halifax Regional Municipality yeah, yeah. is halfway to Cape Breton. No, no, I know. Uh, Halifax Regional Municipality is clearly an example of that. I mean, uh, the town of Bedford would be a population uh, center, uh, and there'd be other population. I mean, Peggy's Cove is within uh, Halifax Regional Municipality. Uh, but it, so it's a single tier, remember everything, it's in the same municipalities, downtown Halifax, uh, and, uh, uh, but I don't know if it has 5,000 people, but uh, yeah, ha ha Nova Scotia is a good, a good example. Um, Peter. Yeah. Hey, I picked up negativity from you about TripAdvisor. <laughs> I don't, so if I'm planning a trip, I don't have any uh, so There's no local control, but surely there's lots of local input. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know exactly how TripAdvisor uh, works. Um, if uh, Isn't it based on experiences of people. Yeah, yeah. No, it's clearly based on if, if you show up at a hotel or a restaurant, you can put your uh, your material in there. But it's no. Uh, uh, it's not locally controlled in any uh, institutional sense. There's no. Uh, local entity that can uh, manage that in any way. Now, if you're planning a trip there, you might think that's a good thing. You don't want to get the official line uh, from uh, from a, a place. Uh, but uh, my argument, I'm not looking at looking at it from the point of view of the person planning a trip. Um, I'm looking at it from the point of view of the people and businesses who are in that community trying to represent themselves to the outside world, which is exactly what. Um, the City of London website does, or the city, of, or the Town of St Mary's website does. Uh, you know, the, the City of London website doesn't. City of London website doesn't just give you uh, the minutes and everything of, of City Hall. It tells you all kinds of great things about London and why you want to be here and what the weather is. And it's, and it, but it's, you know, I don't know. If it's, there must be people in the City of London who are in charge of keeping up with all that stuff or keeping it current. But it's it's under local control. That's the difference. Mark. Yeah. Um, a couple of comments and questions. Um, one is that I, it, it occurs to me that's really interesting that, yeah, this is sort of a unique Ontario problem, um, but it, it's, uh, it's kind of the opposite of a problem, an analogous problem, an analogous but opposite problem that a lot of American metropolitan areas have, right, in terms of place branding, when they're fragmented into like 200 different municipalities. Absolutely, but, yeah. But there's, you know, potentially an interest in selling the place as a whole. Like, how do you do that, right? So it's it just that occurred to me, which is, which is just a comment. But other than that, I guess I wanted to uh, clarify, like, what exactly is the problem from your perspective? Like, I understand that you, there's a problem, but um, if you're all living in, you know, an amalgamated single municipality, it's not about services. So really what you're talking about is representation and kind of like place branding tourism, right, to the rest of the rest of the world. Um, is, is that what you think the missing thing is? Um, um, in terms of the web, yes, that's yeah. the missing thing. Uh, I do think there are other things that I didn't talk about, uh, which would be uh, the, uh, I hate to keep coming back to Wallaceburg, but it is the sort of extreme case. It's the right. Prince, Prince, Edward, the Prince Edward Island case of when you're talking about small places and small provinces. Um, so the people of Wallaceburg have, uh, uh, basically no control over anything that goes on in their freestanding town. I think that's a problem. Um, but it, so, but a, one of the manifestations of the problem is that they don't even have a mechanism to project themselves to the outside world through the most important medium that we have, which is the web. Um, they, they, they could organize in some way. Like, I, don't, I don't know if there's a Wallaceburg Chamber of Commerce, but anyway, they, don't, they don't haven't done that. Yeah. Okay, so I guess that leads to sort of my follow up questions like do you think that this is a problem that really is, you know, 
can be addressed within these bigger amalgamated municipalities? Or, you know, is your argument ultimately that, you know, these shouldn't have been stuck together in the first place? Well. Ultimately, it's that they shouldn't have been put together in the first place. Not so much the regional governments, because I understand the logic of that. Um, I just think somebody should be reviewing that situation now and seeing whether Halton Hills as a place, uh, as a municipality, still makes uh, sense, or whether Clarington still makes sense as a, a municipality. Um, but just to get back to your first part of your question, you're absolutely right. It's the opposite of the fragmented uh, uh, municipal situation in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, and obviously, I just want to underline, uh, I did, if, we, if we were talking about the equivalence of population centers in the U.S., or if we're talking about the population center of Toronto, that doesn't, that statistical category doesn't pay any attention to municipal boundaries. So, uh, yeah, um, so you could have a population, you do have in Toronto, you have a pop, this is, one of the, some people say, you know, oh, Toronto has got a, a megacity. Um, not only is the census metropolitan area fragmented, the population center, the continuous urban fabric of Toronto defined by Statistics Canada is fragmented into, not to hundreds of municipalities, but at least probably a dozen. Um, so, you know, it's, anyway, that's a sort of a separate issue. Jerry, did you have, well, I, yeah. I, I've been fascinated by this because I have a series of questions actually. Okay. But um, what is the oddity of Ottawa? Like, Canada as a case, study within the city of Ottawa, might not, like, Canada doesn't have its own, it used to have its own municipal identity. Yes, it did. And just as Orleans did, and Gloucester, and Nepean, and that's because this part of the central city has, has, has fallen apart, but Ottawa goes on for an hour in every direction. Yeah. So you have a number of small towns that were real places at one point um, that no longer have a sort of presence of any kind, but they're yeah. too small to meet. Yeah, the, the, only, the only one that met the, uh, the 5,000 uh, population number was Manatic, which yeah. is officially called Manatic Station. I was trying to figure out whether there's a difference between Manatic and Manatic yeah. Station, but uh, yeah, Manatic's the, uh, the only one. Uh, and, and the other one that I think is maybe it's the cut of 5,000 is too high is like in Huron County, like, I mean, there, every municipality in Huron County now has some sort of banal name like Huron East, Huron West, Huron Central yeah. Huron. Like you, but like you might have seen on the distance maps like Clinton or Wingham yeah. or Exeter, like places yeah. that people actually knew. And now when you drive like when you drive there, you follow the map. You know, like you follow the yeah, yeah, it, yeah. you know. It's just I mean, I guess it comes back to this question of what the problem is, because those munis those in those small centers, they'd still be the locus <coughs> of political power, just based on their concentration of, of population. So Well it depends what the configuration of the uh Restructured or amalgamated well, municipality. That's a good example of yeah. one direction, but then I'm wondering if in some of these other smaller ones you might find that actually the political problem isn't as acute, other than from a business standpoint. Uh, you know, I think each one of them would merit uh, uh, study because I'm interested in these kind of things. Not everybody is. Um, there's one, uh, I think it's in New York, Huron County, you would know. Uh, is it called, is there a Blue Water? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, Blue Water. so Blue Water is one of the dumbest, uh, uh, I hope you don't work there or something. Um, uh, um, it's, uh, uh, it includes the Bean Capital of Canada, Zurich. Yeah. Um, it includes uh, Bayfield. And uh, Hanson. Oh, these yeah. are three places that are lined up away from the water, right? You've got a water community, uh, uh, Bayfield and Hansel. So I. I did have some involvement there a few years ago because there was a, a movement there to try to de-amalgamate, uh, which, like most of these things, collapsed over time. People lost interest. Um, but they described to me, and they, admittedly, these were people with uh, sort of vested interest in portraying it as not a good arrangement, of how, how every council decision had to do with balancing off the interests of these three different places that had compo that were, that were, diff that were different. And then you had the rural interest as well, which was a different again. Um, I can't uh, conceive of how anybody might have thought that this was a good way of arranging uh, municipal uh, governments. I mean, to me, the virtue of municipal governments is that it provides um, a uh, a way of these real communities to govern themselves collectively. Um, 
Now it does get very complicated in the census metropolitan area, in met larger metropolitan areas. That's what, why I studied them, because I was really interested in that. Um, but um, um, as I said, I think we need to pay attention to the dysfunctionality of, of some of these amalgamated setups that we've created. So yeah, I have a couple points slash questions, I guess. And so the one is, I don't know if, I couldn't really tell if this was a trend or not, but one thing I noticed is that it seemed like the larger population centers were the ones that would be less likely to have their own web, web presence. So Wallaceburg in Canada. Um, and so that I was kind of wondering why, and something we've been sort of skating around a bit is this issue of local identity. And so I don't, like to me, just because of, how our population has grown in the province, a place like Wallaceburg would be, people who live there would be more wedded to a sort of local identity of being born and raised in Wallaceburg, right? And they might say things about people who live in Dresden or whatever as a way to kind of differentiate themselves from them. Whereas someone who lives in, and I don't know the exact geography of all the regional governments, right? But if someone who lives in Georgina and is now part of Halton Hills, right, may have just moved from Georgina they grew up in Toronto, you know, maybe they moved to Georgina uh, and they commute still back to the city. So it's that commuter shed idea, right, that holds the Toronto CMA together um, doesn't exist in some of these other places. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I would, I mean, the web, the web thing is kind of neat to see, but it's almost, it's kind of an interesting from a sort of sociological perspective about how people feel about where they live uh, and whether or not having a municipality matters or not. Well, I, I don't think we can uh, know from the web presence wh whether yeah, exactly. people feel how they feel about it. Uh, but you're absolutely onto something about the commuter situation. Um, uh, with the expansion of population in, in Toronto, there are clearly more and more Toronto-centered people. Uh, living far out and commuting who have uh, very little uh, uh, identification or connection to the place uh, that where they've recently settled. I mean, I heard a horror story, I think it's been reported in local media, uh, in Wichert Stouffville, you know, which is in uh, York Region. Uh, uh, the mayor has done, done strange things, that's, but the other thing was they haven't changed their ward boundaries uh, in uh, decades and um, uh, the places where the new subdivisions have been built uh, are sort of underrepresented by a factor of 10 to 1 or something, and these people don't seem to care. I mean, they've got their kids to look after, they've got their mortgage to pay, they have no particular identity with Wichert Stouffville, so why, you know, why should they care? Except that the old timers who live in the uh, places where the wards have very small populations are calling all the shots and probably screwing the uh, people who were uh, in these areas. So, uh, uh, but. Yeah, whether a place is, uh, another way of categorizing this is the extent to which uh, these places are basically suburban uh, units as opposed to uh, more freestanding uh, places like uh, uh, Port Dover, uh, Wallaceburg, uh, uh, there was uh, Dunville, uh, places like that. Uh, which is much, and, th and those are class those kind of places are classic small town Ontario, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, some places, in small town Ontario still do have their own uh, municipal governments, um, but a lot of them don't anymore. I mean, the classic one that kept it was Newbury in Middlesex County, uh, a population under a thousand, and all, during all this amalgamation stuff, they just said, we don't care, uh, we're not going to amalgamate with anybody. Um, uh, they, uh, they didn't, and they're still there, and um, in other words, they, they uh, uh, they refused to take the bait, you know, if you don't restructure, we're going to restructure for you, they said, well, we're not going to do it, so let's see what happens. And now, 20 years later, uh, they're still there. Um, and I think a lot of people think <laughs> they wish they'd done the same thing. Sorry. Uh, Is there any online questions? Oh, so thousands of people online aren't paying <laughs> attention. That's right. Okay. Uh, it is kind of follow up, and I think you kind of part way answered your question, but our, and it may sound a little too philosophical, I suppose, but I'm wondering. For you, what makes a place really count as a genuine community that deserves representation? Because I, I was thinking about a place like, I don't know, Old East in London, 
right, or Old South, which is, I mean, it's a neighborhood, obviously, but it's got, a, you know, both those places have a strong sense of local identity. They've got local businesses that are interested in promoting and branding and, you know, so, you know, why is representation in a place like that a different kind of issue than representation in a place like I don't list a wall? Well, I just, it, it's, it's, it's a matter of degree, I guess. Uh, first of all, London East did have, uh, was an independent municipality yes. at one time. Until 1885. Yeah, uh, uh, but if we were in the U.S., it probably would still be an independent oh, municipality, okay. um, uh, which you know may or may not be a good thing. Um, but um, uh, it has a BIA, right? The London East has a yeah. Kate. You would know that it has a BIA, um, and uh, so that's a one mechanism for that. Um, um, I wouldn't be in favor of drawing the ward boundaries so that. Uh, you know, the London East area, however you define it, was better represented than uh, Stony Brook Estates or something, uh, you know, just because it had more of an identity. Um, I think if you've got a municipality, you've got to have uh, equal representation from all the uh, equal numbers of people in each ward. Um, but I think places like London uh, and any city like that should be uh, doing as much as it can to uh, perpetuate neighborhood identity, special street signs of the kind that we have in, in many places, all that's good stuff. Um, but it's different, I mean, I do think uh, Old East in London is, a, is, is different from a freestanding uh, place where you're driving along a highway and you come into it and, and, and you've got a town there and then you drive out the other side and you've, you've gone. I mean, that's, that's a, it's just different, but it's the same kind of problem. Um, a difference in degree is what I'm saying. Yeah. I wonder how you could get it at this question here of the unified municipal identity, like looking at how much is spent on libraries. Like in Ottawa, after amalgamation, like there are gorgeous libraries, gorgeous swim pads, pools, everything, but like in the smallest little intersections that you wouldn't even know anyone lived at them. Like they did that as an effort to brand everyone in and bring them into yeah. the city of Ottawa, so to speak. So that they kind of erase the older identities, like because there has to be a metric that you could use to figure out, like what, like what's the grievance for Wallaceburg if there is a grievance, I'm, and how would you measure? To, it? to me, to be honest, if it's not clear, to me the great thing about Wallaceburg is it's the dog that didn't bark. I mean, why aren't these people furious? Mm -hmm. But they don't seem to care. Now maybe one of it, maybe one of the things. Pools. Pardon? Maybe they got great pools. Um, but part of it, you know, that's possible, except I've. I don't think the people in Wallaceburg would say they've been big, great beneficiaries of, of Chatham-Kent. Um, I think part of it is, uh, I mean, Wallaceburg and Chatham and everything have be, been really hit by uh, uh, manufacturing departures and uh, big projects not being built that were supposed to be built. I mean, they're in a bad way, and um, uh, I guess if I would be, more, would be sort of more interested if we could find a prosperous equivalent of Wallaceburg, and maybe maybe there is one on there that I just don't have not recognized. Or Caledonia might be, but Caledonia is, uh, in a sense, the sort of Canada of Hamilton. It's it's just outside the green belt, and that's why it's booming, uh, because people hop the green belt to, to, to get there. So, you know, it probably counts more as Joe's suburban place rather than... Uh, uh. And part of the problem is, in order to make sense of all these, you do have to understand Ontario geography uh, pretty well, um, and I am a native Montrealer, but I did, as many of you know, I was three times on the Federal Electoral Boundaries Commission, uh, and that is one hell of a good way to learn uh, uh, geography, uh, both from figuring out where the boundaries are going to go, and then at all the public hearings where people come up and say, oh, we identify with this group, but we don't identify with that group, and, you know, some of it's sort of stuck in my mind. Um, but, uh, uh, and of course, the geography changes over time. A place that was a freestanding uh, place, then gets like probably Whitchurch or Stovall get, get swamped with uh, new subdivisions, and they're entirely different. They're in an entirely different place than they were 30 or 40 years ago. I suspect our time is. Yeah, we are. Josh has one. Uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a comment and a question. The first is, uh, I sit on the board of management for the Hyde Park BIA, which oh, yeah? is the new BIA. We met this morning and we talked about. Uh, establishing a better web presence and buying an ad campaign to yeah. promote, you know, the area and its identity and encourage people to come there. So I, I found it very interesting. Although we're in the city of London, yeah. it, it seems like there's some similarities to the way BIAs are operating without, 
you know, that, mm -hmm. that you know, government in the same way. And the other thought I had was you examined the web, and what I, I've noticed just in within the city is that there are neighborhoods and populations that seem to be using um, social media, uh, particularly Facebook, to establish pages and groups that seem to, to almost <coughs> replace traditional websites because they're much more interactive. They're promoting um, uh, what's happening in the area. They're planning events and they're, they're doing these things. And I don't know, I know you didn't look at it in this study, but I wonder if there's something in these other areas related to other type of web presence like Facebook that there are maybe cohesive groups, whether it's on specific issues like buying and selling things or whether it's you know for planning events or not. But I know that there are pockets of that, you know, within a city like London. I don't know if they would exist, you know, in some of these areas or not. No, it's a good uh, a good point that was raised earlier about the Facebook pages and I I didn't look at them, I didn't go searching for them. I suspect these uh, but I belong to two Facebook groups, so I sort of know what you're talking about, even though um, my two are my, my high school graduating class and uh, uh, people who used to live in Montreal. Believe it or not, there's a, a, a Facebook group for that. It's got hundreds of thousands of people uh, on it. Um, anyway, um, uh, these communities do form. There's no, no question about it. So I can understand how uh, they... Uh, they provide a mechanism for in an internal kind of uh, community, um, which is important. And I've already said that's another it's, it's something I didn't look at. But it's not the same as projecting yourself to the outside world, um, unless these Facebook groups somehow show up. But I don't know what they would show up on Google because you have to. We're getting into sort of Cambridge Analytica field here. Uh, <laughs> uh, you have to. Uh, be open, don't you? To be, I mean, if you have a group, a closed group, that my high school group, you have to be, you have to be in my high school class to be in it. So it's not going to be, it's not going to show up on a Google search, is it? I don't think. Uh, yeah, it depends. You can have a closed group or an open group. Um, uh, my my thought wasn't that they're not doing a traditional web presence. It said, and, and it's certainly not what you're talking about. But in some cases, I've seen people are more interested in having like a Facebook presence than a web presence. Um, particularly some businesses. And so some of these open groups on specific issues, I, I just didn't know if they were geographically connected. I know, I know you didn't look yeah. at it, but there are ways, if you think about Facebook as almost its own you know, web presence rather than the traditional web, then there, there are interactions happening there that yeah. are interesting. Yeah. No, that, that is important. Now, nobody's answered my question about, uh, does anybody know how wiki boxes come to be? Yeah? I have a feeling that they're, um Part of the Google algorithm. I'm by no means an expert, but uh, basically every time you search through some of that stuff and you take a look at what comes up, it's usually the top post. And if it's Wikipedia, Google knows how to pull out the relevant data from there. So uh, your official uh, profile photo would have been the one that shows up there. And then you're gonna obviously. But not from Wikipedia. I did not. No, Nobody no. Did, did a Wikipedia entry for me, and I sure as hell didn't do one for myself. There is no Wikipedia entry for me. There are really images out there that are... <laughs> yeah, there are, there are images out there, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, like, that kind of stuff usually is what gets pulled into there. I, I have a, I don't know for sure, but I, there might be some kind of human intervention somewhere as a, you know, this makes sense and a lot of that kind of thing, but mm -hmm. I have a feeling it's all just part of the uh, algorithms. Mm -hmm. And just as a little side note, my uh, quick search for Wallaceburg has uh, 6,700 members in the Wallsburg group on Facebook. Really? Okay. Yeah. I mean, that, that is interesting, and so I've learned something from that that I, I didn't think of that. But, but presumably it doesn't come up, I hope, on the, on the Google. Well, I uh, call it it's buy and sell group on Facebook. Yeah. Buy and sell group? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The, um, That's a marketization of local identity. <laughs> it's not... A, anyway, I, you, know, you know what I'm saying. It's yeah, I, I, I checked the, the little box, too, and, and I, there was a little um, uh, button at the bottom that said provide feedback at which point it highlights all the components of the box where you can click on them and then say whether you feel it's correct or not um, yeah. and what the problem is in it. So maybe it's generated and then and people crowdsourced fix it, yeah. to correct it or yeah. add images yeah. or, or yeah. change it. That so, could be. Yeah. I mean, I do think it's interesting that for any of these places, you get this box here and it's created and nobody seems to know where it comes from. I mean, it pops right up at you. Okay. okay, so I think that is it for time. So thanks again uh, to Andy for your talk on this interesting subject. And thanks, everyone, for, for coming out. Uh
Take care and uh, good luck on making it to the end of the semester. Thanks, everybody. Oh, there's a lot of.